Hello and welcome to the webinar on Understanding the National Organic Seed Rule and Sourcing Organic Seed hosted by the Organic Seed Alliance in partnership with eOrganic. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the organic agriculture community of practice with eExtension. You can find all of our published articles, videos, and our many upcoming and recorded webinars on organic farming and research topics on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. We are very, um, very glad to be welcome, welcoming today's speakers, Christina Hubbard, Emily Brown Rosen, Zia Zahneman, and Cullen Carnes Hilliker. So let me pull up some pictures here. We've got a picture of everyone except Cullen. Um, Christina Hubbard, or Kiki, is the Director of Advocacy and Communications for the Organic Seed Alliance, a national organization that delivers research, education, and advocacy that advances the ethical development and stewardship of seed. She is also a contributing author to the Organic Seed Alliance's State of Organic Seed Report in 2011. Emily Brown Rosen is an agricultural marketing specialist in the standards division of the National Organic Program, working on regulations and guidance for organic producers. Um, she has an MS from Rutgers University in horticulture and over 20 years of experience in the organic sector, including as a policy director um, for Pennsylvania Certified Organic, um, the Organic Materials Review Institute, and the Northeast Organic Farming Association of New Jersey. Zia Zanabin is an organic farm inspector and materials policy advisor for California certified um, organic farmers, and she also serves on the National Organic Standards Board. She helped write the first certification handbook and materials lists for organic farming in California. She's a founder of the Organic Materials Review Institute, and she has worked for the USDA and NOSB as a contractor to develop the national list, among many other things. Um, and um, Cullen Carnes Hilliker is a certification specialist at the Midwest Organic, uh, Midwest Organic Services Association. So with that, I'm going to hand things over to our first speaker, um, Kiki Hubbard. Uh, thank you, Alice, and thanks to everyone who's joining us today. As Alice mentioned, Organic Seed Alliance's mission is to advance the ethical development and stewardship of seed. And for those of you not too familiar with our work, we advance this mission through research, education, and advocacy that closely engages farmers and other seed professionals. Our research, for example, involves professional plant breeding that adheres to a participatory plant breeding model, where we work hand-in-hand -hand with farmers and other seed professionals, including university plant breeders, to develop new varieties of seed, as well as improve existing varieties of seed that perform especially well in organic and other low-input production systems. And then we educate thousands of farmers each year in organic seed production and conducting on-farm variety trials, as well as conducting on-farm organic plant breeding projects. And finally, our advocacy work works to promote policies that support the organic seed systems that our research and education programs aim to foster. And I'll be providing some more resource at the, resources at the end of this webinar to support you all as certifiers, inspectors, and certified operations, and be more involved in, in our work in organic seed system development, if you wish. As a quick overview, in today's webinar, um, I'm going to provide you a very quick reminder as to why organic seed is important to the success and integrity of organic agriculture. And I'm going to share just a few findings from our State of Organic Seed project that helps us better understand the issues at hand and the challenges and opportunities in developing organic seed systems here in the U.S. Then I'm going to turn over the microphone to Emily Brown Rosen with the National Organic Program to talk a bit about the program's seed rule, as well as the program's 2013 guidance that aim to clarify this rule. Then we'll hear from a couple members of the certifying inspection community who will share their perspectives on enforcement issues, monitoring, as well as how we can better encourage improved organic seed sourcing. And finally, we'll share at the end of this webinar, a few resources that I just mentioned that will support you all as certifiers, inspectors, and certified operations. And so with that, as I just mentioned in a few minutes, we'll hear from Emily with the NOP about the importance of sourcing organic seed as a regulatory requirement. Alice, I'm having problems oh. advancing. OK, oh, hang on. Yep. Let me see here. Maybe I can go down here. OK, it may have just um, taken. It, I, I don't know, it may, not, may have lost it for a second, so let me uh, give it back to you. Okay, just click on screen once and you should be able to do it. Yep, there you go. Thank you. Um, 
as I just mentioned, we'll hear from Emily in a few minutes with NOP about the importance of sourcing organic seed as a regulatory requirement. But beyond the importance of organic seed as a requirement of the NOP, access to quality organic seed that meets the very different needs of organic producers is paramount Muted. to their success and that of the broader organic industry. We know that seed is the important first link in any production system and provides farmers the genetic tools to confront their day-to-day -day challenges in the field. We also know that these challenges can be quite different from their conventional counterparts, including the solutions available to organic growers in dealing with these challenges. And organic seed is also really important to the integrity of the organic label. By integrity, we don't just talk about what's unwanted or not allowed in organic production systems, such as pesticide residue or genetically engineered traits. But by integrity, we also mean what's desired in the seed being bred, in the seed being produced and sown in production, in organic production systems, from production traits to nutritional quality to also supporting seed production systems that use our resources more sustainably. So first, organic seed can provide growers optimum genetics. Seed varieties bred and produced in organic conditions provide organic farmers with genetics that are better adapted to their low input systems and practices. The literature is growing on this point and we're encouraged by all the improvements we're seeing and in, um, including in, in some investments in organic plant breeding that's delivering better genetics for organic growers. Second, when seed is bred with organic production systems in mind and the diverse organic markets that farmers are serving, food processors and retailers benefit from these improved traits that organic consumers value, including nutrition traits, flavor, color, other quality traits that are increasingly being emphasized by our organic plant breeding community. And then third, organic seed production minimizes upstream pollution. By that we mean because of the current lack of organic seed available and because at times, rightfully so, conventional and treated seed is allowed to be used in organic production systems, this means that at times growers are using conventional seed that's been produced in more chemical intensive systems in conflict with organic principles. And then lastly, organic seed production can provide economic opportunities to growers who are able to successfully integrate seed into their production systems. And these economic benefits range from becoming more seed self-sufficient, reducing input costs and risks by having better adapted seed for their farm, as well as that economic opportunity for um, engaging in commercial seed production through contracts with the organic seed trade. Now, despite the importance of organic seed and despite the organic industry's impressive growth each year, where the organic food industry now represents more than $30 billion, the organic seed sector has simply not caught up to meet the demand of this increased acreage and, and growing market. In 2009, Organic Seed Alliance saw a clear need to better understand the situation at hand. And so we launched our State of Organic Seed Project, uh, which is an ongoing project that monitors the status of organic seed systems in the U.S. And part of this project is to establish an ongoing assessment of the challenges in building the organic seed sector monitoring the organic seed community's progress and engaging the organic community as well in implementing policy research and education solutions identified through our State of Organic Seed report. And this report that you see here on the slide was published in 2011. It was the first comprehensive analysis of the opportunities and challenges in building organic seed systems in the U.S. And as part of our data collection, we conducted a national survey of certified organic crop growers. The purpose of the survey was to better assess certified growers' attitudes and perceptions regarding seed. We wanted to identify obstacles restricting their use of organic seed, and we wanted to provide the organic community information that would be useful to improving the quality, the genetic integrity, and again, the, the use, the increased sourcing of organic seed. At the time we launched the project, there was only anecdotal information to guide the discussions in our community about the state of organic seed systems in the U.S. And so this survey, along with other questionnaires and, and data that we collected, allowed us to hear directly from growers as well as other members of the organic com community, including certifiers, members of food industry, seed industry, um, and others, to assist our discussions on how best to prioritize and address the organic seed community's needs. Now, as just mentioned, and as all 
as you all know on this call, um, the organic seed sector does lag behind. It just hasn't caught up with, with demand. And our National Farmer Survey showed, and this survey, by the way, included certified organic crop growers in 45 states. Um, our survey showed that only 20% of respondents to the survey are using 100% organic seed. And the remaining 80% of respondents pointed to, not surprisingly, a lack of variety availability or equivalency, especially in vegetables. We also found that although price is not an allowable factor for not sourcing organic seed, more than 40% of respondents still indicated that price was a moderate to significant factor when choosing not to source organic seed. And then when it came to perceptions of quality issues, we actually expected distrust of organic seed to be a bigger factor for growers not sourcing organic seed, but in fact only 20% of respondents indicated this as a moderate to significant factor. We also asked producers if they had more, less, or about the same degree of quality issues with organic seed versus conventional seed. And we found that the vast majority of respondents, more than 70%, had about the same degree of problems with conventional seed as they did with organic. Now the good news is that despite challenges in sourcing for some organic farmers, for many organic farmers, Organic seed use is improving. More than half of respondents, 57%, indicated that over the last three years they have increased the percentage of organic seed used on their farm. We also found that more certifiers are requesting that farmers take greater steps to source organic seed, whether that's doing more research, going beyond three sources, conducting variety trials on their farm. And we found that more than 60% of respondents indicated that their certifiers had made requests over the last three years to take greater steps to source organic seed. And perhaps not surprising, we found that when encouraged to take additional steps by certifiers, farmers respond by using more organic seed. So this points to the need, in our opinion, for certifiers to continue to request additional research, to go beyond three sources, to request trialing, uh, and other additional steps to encourage the use of organic seed. And we believe this is especially important for those certified organic operations that continue to be minor uses of organic seed uh, that aren't showing continuous improvement year to year uh, in the context of organic seed sourcing. We also felt it was important through this survey to capture farmers' perspectives on the value of organic seed, including seed bred in and for organic production systems. And we found that organic farmers want organically bred varieties. And we found that this was true across crop types. But you'll see here that the majority of respondents agreed that organic seed is important in maintaining the integrity of organic food production. The majority also agreed that varieties bred for organic systems are important to the overall success of organic agriculture. Importantly, we also found that certified organic growers want to be part of the solution. They want to be part of developing seed systems that meet the different and regional needs of organic agriculture across the country. We found that more than half of the farmers responding to our survey are interested in either producing organic seed commercially or conducting on-farm crop improvement projects, especially if economic opportunity and training are available. And I think that last piece is especially important to remember as we create our roadmap moving forward for supporting these growers and integrating seed production into their systems and, and conducting research if they wish. So some quick, uh, excuse me, some quick conclusions based on what I just shared. Clearly we have ways to go in expanding organic seed availability and encouraging increased sourcing. And yet we are encouraged that our findings show that we're making progress. This progress is at least in part linked to certifiers requesting that certified operations take extra steps to source more organic seed. We also know that we need to improve information sharing to support increased sourcing of organic seed. The organic seed industry has grown tremendously since the rules went to, into effect just over 10 years ago. And we need to ensure that progress in organic seed availability is followed by progress in organic seed sourcing. This will require making organic seed data, availability data, as well as performance data on how varieties are performing in organic systems, for example, making this data as comprehensive and accessible as possible. And 
because there's a strong interest in on-farm breeding and seed production, especially as I said before, if training and economic opportunities are provided, there's a real need to create even more opportunities for organic farmers to work with professionals to integrate seed into their production systems, to participate in organic variety trial networks, and conduct on-farm uh, crop improvement projects at the regional level. We'll have much greater efficiency in addressing the seed needs of the organic market if we can grow our national base of skilled organic seed producers. So lastly, I wanted to share that I'm excited to announce that we'll be releasing a second seed survey to certified organic farmers later this month. And this data will be compiled and then shared at the end of the year um, at listening sessions across the U.S. at organic farming conferences. And then after collecting additional data, as I mentioned earlier, through certifier questionnaires, research, and other surveys, we'll be pu publishing another State of Organic Seed Report in 2015 to serve as um, a, an update on the state of organic seed usage, the ongoing challenges to sourcing, some of, gauge, of course, the improvements we've made in developing organic seed systems, and importantly, provide a, an updated set of recommendations to serve as a roadmap for further strengthening organic seed systems in the U.S. And when we release this survey, we will need your help because last time we conducted the survey, we relied on more than two dozen agencies, organizations, and businesses to help distribute it. So we'll be looking at accredited certifying agencies and others to help distribute the survey to certified organic crop growers across the U.S. And if you're a certified grower on this call, please take the time to fill out the survey when it arrives in your inbox. If you want to be sure you receive a survey or if you want to help distribute the survey or even plan a listening session at an organic farming conference this winter, please email me at the address shown here on your screen after the webinar and I'll make sure that you um, get involved in this project and that, that, that you receive a survey. Um, as I mentioned, too, we'll be distributing this questionnaire to all accredited certifying agencies to inform our recommendations on issues related to enforcement, monitoring, and ways to encourage increased seed sourcing in a way that isn't overly burdensome but is moving us toward continual improvement in the context of the seed issues we face. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Emily of the National Organic Program to begin explaining more about the program's organic seed rule as well as the guidance document that came out last March. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm glad to be here also. This is, this is a great uh, opportunity to, to hear and learn more about organic seeds. Uh, my part of the presentation today is just going to be going over the National Organic Program rule and also we have guidance, a guidance document that I'll be talking about, the requirement for organic seeds. First, I'd just like to show you a little bit where all this information is on our website. We have a lot of information now on the website and sometimes it's a little hard to find things. So I, I'll just run you through it here. Um, this is the URL on the top. You can also just Google USDA NOP and that usually comes up right away as the first uh, hit. Um, this is the home page um, and if you want, want to know what the actual regulations are you go down to this middle section here uh, where we have uh, the organic standards section and you see a link here for organic regulations and another one for program handbook. The regulations are the part where uh, the actual rule as it's in the Code of Federal Regulations are, are um, constantly updated on the electronic version. Um, and the handbook is where we explain the regulations in a little more depth. So if we clicked on handbook, you would get to this next page for the handbook. And then in the middle of the page, you see here this important link is the table of contents. So that's really where you want to head to find the individual documents. Um, a little bit more of word about what, what's a guidance that is in the handbook versus the regulations. Um, the, the regulations are, are pretty hard to change. They're, they're, at, they're at the actual, that combined with the statute equals the laws that, that govern the, the, the requirements for organic farmers. The handbook is, is uh, not a regulation and it's not totally binding on farmers, but it is our best uh, interpretation of the policy. It's a clarification of what is already in the regulations. So we have a little more ability to uh, change the guidance as we need and to update it frequently, which we do. 
to give more clarity, we hoped, uh, about the actual regulations. Here we go. So if we clicked on the on the whoops, I went too far. Okay. Uh, we clicked on the program handbook link, then we get to this list of all these documents, and you scroll down, and you will find this document called Seeds Annual Seedlings and Planting Stock in Organic Crop Production. So this is the guidance number 5029. We issued this last March in 2013, and there's also another document right below it that's also probably of interest. It's the response to comments on this same docket. So when we, when we do guidance, we always put it out first as a draft version, and we let the public encourage the public to comment on us and help correct any errors and, or omissions that we have made and end up with a better document. So we like to publish a response to comments, too, that explains further why some things are in there and some things are not. But um, I urge you to read them both. Now, this is the regulation, the actual uh, part of the regulation is not that long, that deals with seeds and planting stock. Um, it says that uh, basically you, you must use organically grown seeds, annual seedlings, and planting stock, except for a certain number of exceptions here. And the exceptions are that um, you can use non-organically produced untreated seeds and planting stock when there is not an equivalent organically produced variety that is commercially available. So, so that's, the, that's the main requirement. Um, you can use uh, treated seeds and planting stock if the treatment is on the national list. That's this point too. And then continuing. Um, oops, it always goes twice. Uh, you may use a you can also, there's also a few other exemptions. Uh, you can use a non-organic annual seedling only when you have a special variant. So annual seedlings, transplants must be organic, um, organically grown unless you have a special exemption. These things are generally just uh, extreme weather, hurricanes, floods, earthquakes. It's, it's not all that commonly granted, but it would be on a case-by-case -case basis. You have to go through your certifier. The certifier has to ask NOP. So, that's pretty unusual. Um, planting stock also must be organic unless it's commercially unavailable. But if you want to sell the planting stock, say as nursery stock, you must maintain it organically for a, a year before you could do that. And then the last exemption is for special situations where there is a prohibited material that's required by a, another federal law or state sanitary regulations. Okay, so as we noted, the regulation at 204 says you have to use organic seed and planting stock except when the equivalent variety is not available in organic form. So this is where we have a lot of questions. What is equivalent and what is not commercially available? Uh, I wanted to uh, remind everyone, we do have a National Organic Standards Board. It's just our advisory board, and here's a picture of uh, the current board members. Um, there's 15 volunteers that spent a lot of time um, working on recommendations and reviewing materials, and they uh, provide a lot of advice to the program. So in the past, in 2005 and 2008, they wrote two very detailed recommendations to the National Organic Program about uh, seeds and planting stock and when, when it should be organic or not. And this was a general statement that came out of that effort. An organic variety is considered equivalent to a specific non-organic variety if it meets the operations required site-specific site -specific agronomic and marketing characteristics. So that, that was sort of a keystone of their, of their recommendation along with they provided a lot of details on searching methods, uh, justification required for use of non-organic seeds and the type of records that should be kept. So from that, we developed this uh, relatively new guidance from last year, it's this one that I showed you where to find on the website. The, you know, what we say again in this guidance is that equivalent variety means that the variety is of the same type, has similar agronomic or marketing characters. For example, it could be the number of days to harvest, the color, 
the type, the flavor, uh, is it hardy in your region, is it vigorous, is it disease resistant, disease resistant and is it generally adapted to your climate and your needs. So that would, that would if you had a, a non-organic variety that didn't meet these, or an organic variety did not meet these requirements and you were really happy with a non-organic and you couldn't get this, then that, those would be a justification reasons a farmer might use in order to use the non-organic variety. Now, what is not commercially available mean? Um, this is actually defined in the regulations. We have a whole section of definitions that covers a lot of things. Uh, but this means it's the lack of ability to obtain the seed or the planting stock in the appropriate form, quality, or quantity. So we clarified in the guidance that form means something like treated or non-treated seed, if it was pelleted or not pelleted, or bare root or container plant, something about the way the, the planting material was delivered to you. Quality would include things like germination rate, weed content, shelf life, whether it's free of disease. Quantity could be either large or small. And as Kiki mentioned before, a price is not supposed to be a factor in the selection. Um, there's a lot of other reasons here that are that are considered valid reasons that farmers might not be able to find an equivalent variety, but price is not supposed to be one of them. Uh, the guidance also talks a little about planting stock, which is considered to be any plant tissue like tubers, roots, cuttings, anything other than annual seedlings or seeds. Um, all planting stock must be organic unless the equivalent organic variety is not available. And so this, this would include things like garlic, potatoes, strawberries, etc. But if you want, as I mentioned before, if you want to sell perennial planting stock as organic, you have to manage it organically a year before sale. Um, the guidance also goes into detail about records that should be maintained by growers. Growers need to list all the non-organic seeds or planting stock that is used in their organic system plans and provide justification for using it. Uh, we agree that on-farm trials should be encouraged and that could be described as a valid method of, of justifying the need for certain types of seed. Um, the growers also should describe methods of searching for organic seed and contact at least three sources. And of course, these sources should include companies that actually sell organic seed. Uh, the guidance document also talks about the treatments that are permitted for seed. So uh, we have a few items on the national list. Normally, all materials used in organic crop production that are synthetic have to appear on the national list. So we do have a few sanitizers, such as parasitic acid, chlorine, uh, specific one, hydrochloric acid, is only for cotton. And, but there's other materials also that may be used for fertility reasons or fertilizer, fertilizer disease, pest resistant. Um, the chlorine is sometimes used for sanitizing seed and pathogen control, and we clarify in the guidance that this is permitted provided that it's followed by regular potable water rinse afterwards. Um, what does need to be, the, the guidance goes into what needs to be reviewed basically by the certifier. You need to have, be prepared to provide the certifier with, with information about any treatments used on the farm or applied to the, to the seed uh, by the organic seed purveyor. Yeah. So things that are included in pelleting agents, inoculants, and any pesticides applied to the seeds all need to be documented. <clears throat> For inoculants, you'll need to have proof that there is, if it's like a rhizobial or a bacterial inoculant, that it's not genetically engineered. Things that don't need review include any treatments that were on non-organic seeds prior to harvest or for post-harvest handling of, the, of that seed, such as cleaning agents, like sometimes there's trisodium phosphate or chlorine treatment, but those on a non-organic seed, that information is going to be very hard to find. So if you have gotten the okay to use the non-organic seed, it's justified, then you don't really have to look that hard at the um, treatments that were used to grow it as a non-organic seed. 
The certifier's job is to verify the procedures and the justification for commercial availability. They have to review all these substances, as I've mentioned, and they, and most importantly, should review the progress over time that the producer is making in, in sourcing organic seeds. So um, we agree that's a that's a, a very worthy goal. It's a hard one to necessarily achieve, but that's that's part of the reason to keep. Um, working on this and getting more information about what organic seeds are out there. Um, as I said, this is a guidance document and, and the guidance documents are a bit more flexible. So uh, we have a special email address here and we take comments anytime on amending uh, these documents. So if you have thoughts or a better way to do it, we'd be happy to uh, hear about it. So please send them on in. I think that's all I have to cover today. I hope you all enjoyed it, and we'll be having the questions later. Alice, do you want to take it over? Sure. Um, our next speaker is Zia Zahneman. Um, we don't have a PowerPoint for Zia to show. Thank you for inviting me. Um, well, Emily uh, provided a good segue into what I wanted to talk about, which is um, what happens in the field in for us inspectors. You did to try and provide enough information for a certifier to assess the organic seed uh, requirement. Um, first of all, there's um, all the amount of guidance and regulation and stuff in the world doesn't address every single situation that you find in the field in the exact way. And so uh, there's definitely a need to be flexible for inspectors in uh, working with the growers who um, are using seed in order to uh, determine compliance with the requirements. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, because I work primarily in California, it's mostly oriented towards vegetables, uh, although certainly what I have to say will also apply to other types of crops as well as cover crops, which are also required to be organic seed if possible. So as Emily mentioned we um, look for improvement and so one of the first and oddly enough most difficult things to determine in many cases especially in as farms get larger and more diverse and have to uh, and have a variety of markets is who's making the decisions about what seeds and what varieties need to be used there are a number of arrangements um, that I'm sure are not unique to California but um, are quite prevalent here of contract growers, um, both in fresh and processing. And oftentimes in the processing world especially, the variety will be determined by the processor and not by the grower, or at least the characteristics will, and so the grower will be told we need a 90-day onion so it comes to the plant at a certain schedule. Um, and then that very much narrows their choices of what they can look for in an organic seed. And yet that is, um, you know, it has, that's one of the criteria in the guidance. It has to be available in the sufficient uh, form that is needed by the grower. In the fresh market um, now, we're seeing a number of companies who actually provide seed to and planting services to growers, and then the growers do the other field activities, and then the buyer comes back in and does the harvest. In that case, it can be really tricky because um, the grower doesn't even handle the seed that goes into his field at all, and trying to even get the records out of it is um, from the other company um, has been challenging and then it, it becomes whose responsibility is it to determine um, that the organic compliance whether it's the certifier of the grower that we're talking to or the certifier of the other handling company so uh, we wade through all that and try and figure out whose decision it is to uh, of what seed to get and then we try to um, look at their compliance activities. So um, for the rest of this, I'm going to assume that I'm talking to the person who is the decision maker about seed. 
Well, another situation that we often find is um, they're they're growing a hundred different varieties of crops. So um, Emily did put one slide up that said they need to have a list of all their varieties. Well, yes, they do. But now in the area in the er, in the time of Sound and Sensible, we're not trying to collect that list anymore or type it all into our report for every single one of 100 varieties. And this, you know, this is not just big growers in terms of the many varieties. Uh, growers who specialize in farmers markets tend to have the most varieties of anybody because they need a big diversity and they have succession plantings and all the rest. So we look at their at the seed records in the field and we look at the planting list and generally don't try to do a commercial availability um, discussion on every single variety. We scan over which we ask them to keep the rec in their records which seeds are organic or not and where they got them from. We take a look at the receipts for those seeds to make sure they're clearly identified as organic on the receipts. And then I'll usually select a few non-organic varieties and ask them to give detailed reasons about why they chose a non-organic variety, where they looked for it, and that, and put the information about a few of the selected varieties into my report, overall, along with an overall assessment of uh, what, um, you know, whether they've improved in their source, search for organic seed, whether they've contacted more seed companies, whether they've uh, been able to find more varieties, whether they're doing variety trials, and whether they've used some of the uh, resources that they've been pointed to through things like this, through other uh, information sharing efforts. So, um, it you know, it's Inspectors have a complicated job because we have to know enough about organic seed availability to know that if the grower says, I'm growing Detroit dark red beets, that, okay, we know there's a Detroit dark red beets out there organically, and it's how much do you need? Is it, are you using too much to be commercially available? Are you requiring it in a certain form that isn't commercially available? Um, and likewise, if they choose another variety of beets that we know that that one is not. So we're, we inspectors hopefully are continually scanning um, many, many seed companies to know in a general way what's out there. And then the certifier who is going to look at our reports has to do likewise to be able to um, verify our observations. <laughs> then uh, one really handy thing that has happened um, in just the last year since Organic Seed Finder came out is there's now a request button on it so that if you can't find the variety you're looking at for, um, you can click on this button and then you can enter in information like I'm looking for a long day onion for processing that I could not find organically and you can then, I believe, print out something that says, okay, I, pr I looked for this and here's my record of looking for it. And you can show it to the inspector. And that's a very good way to document that you couldn't find organic seed. And also at the same time, to tell the seed company um, who may have access to those, the collected information that, that maybe they should focus on getting some processing onions developed for in organic seed. So, um, you know, I'm I'm really hope that people start using Organic Seed Finder more and more. We um, try to keep inspectors trained, and now when I say we, I, I'm talking about CCUF, who I primarily work for, and um, while I'm a contract inspector for them, I work on policy issues uh, for the trade association side. So from the certifier point of view, it's continual challenge to keep inspectors trained and informed of all the seed issues and resources. It's a challenge to uh, determine what Im continuous improvement actually means. Because rarely can we say, rarely as an inspector can I say, 
uh, okay, they used 5% organic seed last year, and that, this year they used 10%. Because is it by seed varieties, or is it by seed volume, or is it by acreage planted, or there's so many different variables that all you can you can't quantify it in, in any very easy way, but you can get a sense of whether improvement is happening from looking at all of those variables. Then um, another certifier challenge is um, keeping pressure on growers, but without having any ability to enforce um, things that are somewhat minor infractions. So if we don't see enough improvement, we'll get usually they'll get a reminder that they have to keep trying to find organic seed. And, but what happens if that reminder stays around for a year or two or three or whatever? It's like, when do you cross the line into an actual non-compliance for a grower? And that's something very, very hard for certifiers to determine. And then the continual need for networking and for things like this to, um, keep both inspectors, clients, uh, certifiers, and everybody informed about uh, sources of organic seed and ways to improve the use of organic seed. It's very encouraging to see that the organic seed industry is growing. There's more and more seed out there every year. But in order for all the stakeholders uh, from the seed users to the seed growers and all the companies in between to expand until organic seed is the norm and is diverse enough to be used for all crops and uses. It's very important that um, we all work in parallel to bring up the use and the production at the same time. So that's what I hope we're helping do today and um, that's what I have to say. Thank you. Good morning. Um, my name is uh, Cullen Carnes Hilliker. I'm a certification specialist and staff inspector with uh, MOSA, the Midwest Organic Services Association. And uh, we are, uh, sent, are, are located in, in southwestern Wisconsin and, and certify roughly 1,400 uh, farms throughout the, the Midwest and, and definitely the organic uh, seed requirements are a, a daily um, something that we we work with and and um, attempt to uh, find compliance on on a daily basis um, you know and our role as the certification agency is to you know use the farmers organic system plan uh, coupled with the inspectors comments and in their inspection report to assess compliance with the organic seed rule and how we do that is uh, through through the organic system plan. We do we do ask for uh, the the producer's overall system of um, searching for and complying with the organic seed rule. Um, and we do we do ask for a a full list of of seeds that are being purchased or used uh, in the uh, organic system. And we're we're a little different, you know. In the Midwest, uh, you know, many of our of our farms are, are dairy farms, or we have we work with more, um, you know, row crop operations: uh, corn, soybeans, uh, grain, alfalfa, hay. Uh, so the, the our many of our producers have pretty short lists of of organic uh, of, of seed uses seed used. So it, it the the ability to uh, submit a, a full list is, is a little bit uh, easier, but we do ask for the, the type of crop, the, the form, whether it's seed, seedling, or planting stock. We ask for the variety, uh, the source, what company, or whether it's uh, uh, grown on farm, the organic status, the treatment, uh, whether there's an uh, inoculant used. And then we ask for documentation of the organic seed search. Um, types of non-organic seed that are, are going to be used on the farm, uh, documentation for the companies or the dealers that are contacted, and, and we do require at least three sources, um, the date in which the contact was made and the, the reason for purchasing uh, non-organic seed. And so for each type of non-organic seed, we would require uh, some kind of justification as, a, as has already been uh, stated, either the the, the quality of the seed is um, 
uh, they haven't been able to find an equivalent variety in, in an organic seed. Or, or another interesting um, part of it is the quantity. I think that that, that happens frequently that, that a, a, a corn farmer is, is needing, you know, hundreds of pounds of, of corn seed and can only find, you know, 50 pounds in, in, a, in an organic variety uh, so that they, they may need to purchase the, the non-organic variety in order to make up what they need to, 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 um, to farm, you know, 50 acres of, of corn. Um, so that, that's another, uh, another thing that we see frequently. Um, when it comes to organic seed searching, we also would allow uh, the, the use of, of uh, seed catalogs as sufficient documentation for searching uh, for organic seed. This is something that, that we feel is a, is a practical equivalent to actually having to write down every single type of seed and the justification and um, the um, and, and as long as those those catalogs were from companies that that sold organic seed, we feel like that would be a uh, it's an equivalent type of documentation, uh, as would be just a form with a um, that someone would have to to fill out. Um, that's been a practical um, response to the the requirements. Then with the, on the inspector side, uh, again, repeating that, that the inspector's role would be to verify the um, receipts. And we do ask for uh, a copy of either the, the bag of, of um, either one of the, the bags of seed or the, the tag to show treatment and the variety uh, that, that's being used, uh, one tag from each type of variety of, of seed. Um, and if there's any need to have additional untreated or non-GMO documentation available at the inspection, the inspector does, you know, do a, 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 a small uh, audit of the uh, seeds used by the farmer uh, to verify that those those seeds that are non-organic are that there wasn't an equivalent variety or a, a, the, the quantity um, wasn't available in inorganic. Um, and, and then, you know, writes up a report verifying or, or you know, commenting on the, the system of, of searching and, and sourcing organic seed, and then the compliance with the organic seed, seed requirements. Uh, then when we, as the, the final reviewer of the, the operation, the inspection report, and the uh, farmer's organic system plan, we do have a, a kind of a three-step uh, process of, of enforcement, you know, as, as Zia mentioned, you know, we have a, a, a reminder that would just be, you know, uh, something about, you know, you, you only purchased, you know, X number of uh, bags of organic seed this year. We would, we would like to see uh, additional improvement over the course of, of uh, the next couple of years, or you didn't document your organic seed search, or, or some way to just, you know, um, move the, the producer into um, understanding what the requirements are for sourcing organic seed. And then if we don't see improvement over time, we would move that to a condition for continued certification. If we haven't seen sufficient uh, uh, improvement to purchase organic seed or to search for organic seed sufficiently. And, and we have, you know, over time, uh, if there's significant resistance to uh, searching for organic seed or for uh, purchasing organic seed, we have moved it on to a you know the, a notice of noncompliance, which would potentially have the impact of, of uh, uh, either um, or some type of adverse action that would um, you know suspend the operation from organic certification if if for some reason uh, there there wasn't sufficient response to that noncompliance. It happened it's happened rarely that we've moved to the notice of noncompliance, but if we've seen over a number of years that there's been enough resistance to purchasing or trialing or, or searching for organic seed, that, that's one of the things that we, uh, we can do and, and have done um, in order to uh, show compliance for the organic seed rule. Uh, we do retain the, the seed table or the seed list and the organic seed search records over time so that we can see improvement uh, or if there's some kind of, you know, it moves forward and then moves backward and, you know, you, you, you purchase some one year and then you don't purchase as much the, the next year uh, just so that we have some level of uh, understanding of comparison from, from year to year. It's important for us to monitor trends 
Uh, and I think that the, the NOP guidance has been really helpful for us to uh, point to as, as you know, additional justification for our, our kind of increased scrutiny for organic farmers. Um, but we also do provide resources when, when necessary uh, for both the requirements um, of what, what is, you know, what's necessary for farmers to uh, comply with the organic seed rule and also resources for uh, seed, seed dealers, seed companies um, in, in the Midwest and, and or other, um, you know, whether it's the, the web-based, uh, the organic seed finder or the pick a carrot uh, websites. Um, we do, you know, when, when it's necessary or when someone is, is needing uh, additional resources, then, then we would point them to these other, um, other places to, to find organic seed. Um, a couple of the, the challenges that we've seen uh, that have already, you know, somewhat been mentioned, uh, that, that the, it's definitely challenging for, for many farmers, especially vegetable farmers, I think, to, to find uh, equivalent organic varieties um, from the non-organic uh, seeds that they're using. Uh, additionally, as has been mentioned already, it can be challenging when the, uh, the buyer of, of the um, primarily vegetables uh, requires a specific seed variety that, that cannot be found in our organic um, uh, equivalent organic variety uh, that can be challenging. And we still would require that the buyer provide some type of seed search uh, to verify that the uh, that the, the, the seed that they're requiring of their producers or the people that, that we're working with, um, uh, you know, have that, that, that the search has been done and that there's nothing that's, that's equivalent. Um, I did want to mention, and I don't know how many, um, you know, row crop farmers or dairy farmers are on the, on the call, but um, we have seen, you know, over time that, you know, corn, soybean, um, uh, small grains, um, the the organic seed um, available to these types of farmers uh, has increased at potentially a, a a quicker pace than for vegetable farmers. We've seen that there's the 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 varieties that are out there for corn and and soybeans uh, is is sufficient to provide similar uh, you know characteristics uh, for um, uh, than, than organic seed and, and have seen that, that many, many dairy farmers and, and row crop farmers are, are finding what they need in the organic seed community, um, which may be a little bit different than vegetable farm uh, uh, experiences, but, but I think just as a, another um, you know, success of the organic seed community. Um, that, that we've seen you know, more of a, um, a balancing of the, um, the ability of, of certain types of farmers to find organic seed that, that, that they can use that's equivalent. So that's been uh, one success, the one thing that we've seen over time. I think that's, uh, that's it that I have. Okay, Kiki, did you want to conclude? So, yeah, I'll just run quickly through these resources, again, that aim to support all of you as certifiers, inspectors, and operations. Just a few resources that help with sourcing organic seed, finding organic seed performance data, encouraging organic variety trials, and integrating organic seed production, um, as well as engaging in organic seed policy discussions like these moving forward. You can advance. Oh, it. sorry. <laughs> okay, here we go. <laughs> so quickly, uh, Organic Seed Finder has been mentioned both by Zia and Cullen. Uh, this is a project, um, or a tool I should say, that came out of a working group that Organic Seed Alliance facilitated following our State of Organic Seed project. Time and time again, we heard from stakeholders that a new and improved organic seed database was needed to provide better and more reliable information about organic seed availability. Um, the NOSB in 2005 and 2008 also recommended this in their recommendations to the NOP, the need for uh, this clearinghouse of information. The purpose was twofold, provide a reliable resource for finding and promoting organic seed and to also assist organic certifiers in the verification of seed sources. 
Um, it's also the only organic seed database available that is officially endorsed by the National Organic Program. Currently, there are 16 vendors par participating, representing uh, almost 3,000 seed variety listings. And we're in the process of working with AASCA, the Association of Official Seed Certifying Agencies, which is the organization that uh, hosts and manages this Organic Seed Finder website. Organic Seed Alliance leads the promotion around this website. And we're in the process of working with AASCA to implement a number of technology upgrades in the coming months. You can advance. Two features I wanted to highlight, they were noted briefly by Zia. Here's um, a snapshot of the, or I should say a screenshot of the Organic Seed Finder website. This arrow is pointing to the tool that Zia referenced where you can report which varieties you're having a hard time finding in a certified organic form. And this information is critical to providing a feedback loop to inform the organic seed breeding and production community and to inform uh, catalog decisions and, again, production decisions um, within the organic industry. So we encourage you to check that out and, and to use it and to encourage users of the site to use that feature as well. You can advance out. Another feature I wanted to mention, I believe um, Zia also referenced that there's this timestamp to assist organic certifiers in the verification process with each search. Um, each search uh, receives a timestamp. And also, as you'll see with this listing uh, available with this screenshot, you can also see when this data was updated, when uh, the seed vendors last updated their variety listing. So that, again, you have a sense of how reliable the information is. Um, it's not meant to serve as real time, but you'll see that all the seed vendors participating are doing a really good job of providing updates to their listings um, more, than, more than once a year and sometimes actually monthly. You can move ahead, thanks. And then, of course, the providing growers information about how varieties perform in organic systems is really important. Um, you know, it's important beyond just growers understanding what varieties are available to them, understanding how these, how the varieties they're using or thinking of using perform in their organic production systems um, and in their region is critical to their success. And so uh, eOrganic hosts this Organic Variety Trial Reports database. It was launched a couple years ago. Organic Seed Alliance helps to manage the data that's uploaded to the system, and it serves as the only collection of organic variety trial results housed in a searchable database. The system is very easy to use. It's straightforward. You'll see here that users have the option of searching by both region and crop, and you can check out the database for yourself following this webinar at the link provided on your screen. I'll also provide you this link again in just a second. This one you need to click um, two more times. Oh, okay, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> okay, um, yeah. Finally, uh, it's important that we also support growers in building their skill sets in producing seed, as well as conducting variety trials on their farm to help them identify which varieties are going to perform well in their uh, specific system. As I mentioned earlier, when certifiers encourage producers to take additional steps, they often respond by sourcing more organic seed. And so we'd like to see seed producers who, again, are de who do not demonstrate continuous improvement in their organic seed procurement year to year to be encouraged to conduct additional research. And this research uh, could include consulting more than three sources, conducting organic variety trials. And on our website for this latter point, we offer a free, um, a free manual for organic farmers to support them in conducting on-farm trials for organic vegetables and herbs. And we also have a number of variety trial planning worksheets available on our website that help growers outline and plan these variety trials, as well as evaluate their results to ensure that the information is, is useful, the information that they're collecting through these trials. And then for certified operations interested in building their knowledge and skills in organic seed production, as well as on-farm crop improvement, we also offer more than a dozen manuals to support these growers in integrating seed production work and plant breeding work into their organic um, farms. And all of these publications and more can be found on our website at seedalliance.org under the publications link. And on this next slide that Alice is going to pull up, you'll find. Oh, okay. um, it's down at the bottom. I'll go get it. <laughs> okay. Oh, okay. Um, you'll, you'll find a link to uh, our website. If, um, if we don't get to everyone's questions today, um, I'm also putting my email up here on, the, on this last slide. 
feel free to email me following the webinar. Um, I'm providing the eOrganic resources here. There's an organic seed resource guide that provides uh, a, an overview and reminder of the organic seed requirement. This is updated on a regular basis. We're actually working on updates right now um, at Organic Seed Alliance. And then Organic Seed Alliance, as some of you might know, hosts a biennial conference called the Organic Seed Growers Conference. Uh, our last conference was this past January in Corvallis, Oregon. And at this YouTube link here, you'll find a number of archived webinars, including another webinar that gets into even more detail about the organic seed availability issue, understanding the organic seed guidance, how to improve organic seed sourcing, um, among a, no a number of other organic seed issues related to research, education, and policy. And lastly, I just want to encourage everyone to get involved in the policy discussion. Um, we appreciate very much the National Organic Program's ongoing effort to clarify the organic seed requirement to ensure that the credibility of the organic seal is, is long term. And we're glad to see a final guidance document come out last year. We are in the process of finalizing a number of recommendations uh, that we believe would strengthen this guidance even more. And if you would like to be part of this discussion, again, please get in touch with me. We'd love to have diverse stakeholder input. And the intention of these recommendations is never to force producers to use varieties that are inappropriate for their systems, but we want to move toward continual improvement in the context of organic seed through improved sourcing, as well as organic variety trialing. So with that, I am going to stop there and thank everyone so much for joining us today, and we'll open it up to questions. Get started on the questions. We have a lot of them coming in. Um, one of them was, or actually several of them, were about the organic seed finder. Um, in terms of the level of detail on that, um, if you go on the organic seed finder and um, you look at a particular variety, is there a way um, that tells you what varieties are considered equivalent? Is there a way to find that information as well? I'll go ahead and answer that. Uh, currently, there is not a system for identifying which varieties are equivalent. This has come up actually recently um, in a workshop that we conducted that provided an overview of the website and how to use it. Um, so it is on our list of things to consider as possible improvement. So definitely appreciate the comment. And if you have suggestions um, about other improvements, and including the specific recommendation, uh, do send me an email. Okay, and then also, um, does it include all varieties, or does it just include those varieties that um, companies submitted information on? Um, companies are asked to submit uh, those varieties that they provide in a certified organic form. And so, uh, you know, yeah, companies are providing their full listing of certified organic varieties, um, as far as I know. I mean, that might be a better question uh, for each particular company, but it, each list uh, appears to be quite comprehensive in scope. OK. Um, we have um, uh, several questions um, that are kind of specific um, for Emily about the um, NOP regulations. Um, so this one, um, I guess, wants some clarification about, um, she said, he says, I understand from her presentation that an NOP certified operation in Mexico could use non-organic seed with non-organic treatment, both with justification, specifically, for an example, a bell pepper variety canon is not produced organically and a substitute organic variety has not been found in trials. The seed seller doesn't offer a particular treatment um, and it's against Mexican law to import seed without a treatment. So canon has to be treated chemically, for example, with thyrum. Is it possible to use this in an organic operation in Mexico? <laughs> so does anybody want to address that question, um, either Zia or um, Emily, for example? You can, everybody well, can on me. I, I think I'll get Zia to weigh in here. Um, but, I, you know, according to the rules, no, you cannot use thyrum treated in Mexico. But I know there's been some issues. Uh, with Mexican and their treated seed requirement. We do, you know, there is an a exemption for when there's a federally mandated treatment uh, for phytosanitary reasons. However, that, that has been interpreted to mean only U.S. federally mandated and U.S. states because our rule is really written for the U.S. So, Zia, do you have any update on the, on the Mexican situation? Yeah, um, we have been trying for years to 
get the Mexicans to change their regulations so that they are similar to the U.S. and so that um, organically approved treat seed treatments can be allowed. And a few of them are, but not all of them. Um, Mexico has recently put out their own organic regulations, which um, I don't think are quite in effect yet. And I'm hesitant to even say this, but when they are in effect, you will be able to wash the thyram off and then use it in production for Mexico sales of organic food. You would not be able to use that for import into the U.S. because uh, prohibited seed treatments are not allowed in the U.S. for any reason. But if you're selling it in Mexico, you can wash off the thyram the way that I understand their regulations to read. Okay, thank you. Um, here is a question um, for Kiki, I think. Um, did the survey in the um, State of the Seed um, report determine an average percentage of organic seeds used by variety for the respondents? In other words, is there information by um, broken down by crop types, types, for example, vegetable growers? Not by crop types. Um, that's a great question, um, and certainly not by varieties. Um, there, the, the survey went to a, into a lot of detail, and I encourage you to look at the survey results in the actual document that's on our website. But no, it did not go down to that level of detail. We did. There were other questions that where we did identify which crop types producers responding to the survey would like to see um, prioritized in crop improvement projects as priorities in organic plant breeding programs moving forward. Um, but not um, by crop types. Okay, um, here's a question. I know Zia brought up this issue, um, and so did Colin. Is there any guidance for the amount of time, um, the number of years, a producer is reminded in regards to organic seed compliance before non-compliance is given? Uh, this is Colin. And I think what we would probably do at MOSA is to, you know, as a as the final reviewer would look at the overall operations compliance with the the seed rule. It's a case by case basis of um, what level of continuous improvement has been shown over time. There are, you know, there's kind of the in between stage of between a reminder. There's this. Uh, you know, condition for continued certification that could be could be used as kind of the next step of of um, compliance verification that um, you know would be we'd we'd want to see more significant improvement if it went to a condition and uh, typically you know when when we when we communicate to the the farmers that we work with these types of requirements we see improvement almost automatically almost immediately in the next year so that there's a um, and once we see improvement we probably would not have a additional um, require you know additional reminders or additional conditions it's a it's something that that uh, is a, a, a rare occurrence to go go to the, the notice of non-compliance I, I think it's you know only happened um, you know a few times total Okay, is there any um, plans for official guidance to be um, issued in that regard? Uh, this is Emily. Uh, I don't believe so at this time, but um, I might not know everything that's in the works here. Okay, thanks. Okay, um, here's another question for Emily. Um, can you clarify the response called the annual perennial distinction in the response to the comments? Um, it said on there, someone looked at it and said, NOP agrees that making a distinction between annual and perennial planting stock based on how a particular operation chooses to produce the crop will not provide consistent interpretation and in implementation of the regulations. For example, does this mean that in Florida where we can go strawberries as an annual crop, we must still adhere to the planting stock rules as if it were a perennial and must manage it organically for one year before harvest? No, it, what it means is, um, when since it's plant uh, the strawberry crowns or 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 if you use uh, transplants are planting stock and you can harvest it 
as an annual, you can harvest it as a perennial, but you still have to go through the same commercial non-availability protocols in order to use the non-organic planting stock. If you wanted to dig it up and sell tips as planting stock, they would have to be managed organically a year. But um, for harvesting, no, you can harvest. It, that's what we realized is that it was kind of arbitrary to call, you know, make a division between annual and perennial planting stock since more and more different crops are being grown as annuals. So it's just, it's just, uh, you know, it just has to all follow the same procedure for commercial availability. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we'd gotten a couple of questions on that. Um, we're also um, getting a number of questions um, about um, how to determine whether seed is organic um, and um, whether or not any treated seed may be used or whether um, GMO seeds can be used when organic seed is not available. I don't think that's permissible in organic production, but if somebody wants to elaborate about those things, um, Please do. Well, I'll, this Emily, I'll just jump in quickly. No, no, or no, you can never use GMO seed even if um, non-GMO is not available. And organic seed should be certified. You should have a certifier seal or, or a name on it, or it could have the USDA seal. Um, what was the other question? Oh, treatment. Treated treatment. Seed, yeah. 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 If it's certified organic seed, the treatment will be reviewed as part of the certification process. So you, you don't have to look at it too closely as long as it's a valid certification. If, if it's untreated seed, you, the growers need to get as much information as possible and the certifiers need to review the treatment to make sure it is compliant. So sometimes you'll see companies, see companies advertise a NOP compliant pellet, for example, but, um, you need to refer that and, and make sure that that information is available to your certifier to review. Okay. Um, if seed quality is the issue with an organic seed variety, um, how should that be documented? So I think they might mean if quality is an issue with a non-organic or yeah, with an organic seed variety, they, they think that it's not good enough right. quality. How how to document that? Maybe Colin would be good. I could answer yeah, I that. Yeah. Go ahead. Go ahead, Colin. Uh, I think a lot of uh, farmers already have some system in place for documenting the, you know, the impact of or the the what's, you know, the the type of the type of seed they used and what the the quality of the the uh, whether it's seed germination or whether there's some kind of uh, uh, disease issues, or if there's, um, you know, those are those are two of the big ones. But I think that there's uh, justification for purchasing non-organic seed can certainly be based on, you know, the the ineffectual uh, or the the the, cha the problems with the organic seed from the year before. Um, and and certainly we would ask the inspector to look at those types of of documents or you know keeping that in your maybe in your uh, greenhouse records or in your um, you know field activity logs uh, that would be part of the the normal um, you know documentation that's necessary to um, you know verify the overall organic system but this would be specific to, to the seed the seed being used um, and showing that to the inspector and the inspector would would use that as part of their um, their comments and, and report on uh, organic seed use and um, the the uh, you know verification or the the justification of using non-organic seed if that's what's if that is necessary for farmers did you want to add to that Sia? no that covered it fine thank okay, you okay great um, okay, um, from a certifier perspective, how do you manage the timing of renewal, which is usually the winter or spring, with the timing of seed purchasing? So many clients note or state, I didn't know exactly what varieties I would need when I submitted my renewal. Yeah, that's certainly something that we, we see uh, happen frequently, that the, you know, we, we require our update application to come on, on May 1st. So many people, as they submit their application, have not purchased seeds yet. Um, and as part of the review of documentation for, uh, you know, to be, 
you know, right before the, the application goes to the inspector, uh, we would potentially include a, a statement to, you know, have your, you know, your seed table and your organic seed, seed search documentation available for the inspection. Uh, it may not necessarily be required to be submitted with the update application. Um, that it could be available at the inspection, and that would be, um, at least for us, sufficient to, to you know, verify compliance. Um, uh, but, but usually for someone who's brand new, they do need to submit some type of list of seeds that they plan on using, so that that can be a challenge, you know, based on the timing of their um, application and the, the needs of, of the um, what type of crops they're growing, but usually the seed buying season is, you know, January, February, March, around in there, and it doesn't it doesn't always have a, a an impact, but sometimes it does, and and we're not um, it may not necessarily need to be submitted with the update application. Okay, um, let's see. We have somebody wondering about the state of the U.S. organic mark uh, seed market. Um, so, in other words, how much um, how much demand is there for organic seed? Anybody, Kiki, do you want to talk about that? Or? Yeah, I mean, the the demand is reflected by by the need to fulfill um, the growing marketplace and growing acreage here in the United States. I am not aware of an actual number to help answer that question. And our data collection has focused on again, as I mentioned earlier, growers' experience with organic seed, um, what they're sourcing, and, and trying to qualify some of that. Um, but certainly the demand is there is if you look at how that is reflected by the growing organic food marketplace, which continues to grow year after year. And if anyone else on this call has um, other information that might be helpful in answering that market-specific question, you can jump in. Okay, um, this is probably a question for Emily. How, or, or others, how is GMO contamination affecting seed purity and organic seed availability, and what is the USDA doing to address this issue? Well, it's Emily. Um, I think some other people are going to have to answer, you know, how it's affecting the industry. Um, you know, we've issued policy statements on on GMO contamination, um, acknowledging that you know there can be some adventitious presence, but that doesn't necessarily uh, cause a farmer to lose certification if there's, you know, if they're taking good faith effort to prevent contamination. If it's not, you know, not intentional, um, we do have um, new testing protocols that there's um, spot testing being done by certifiers for prohibited substances, and also could include. Um, genetic engineering to see that it's not being, you know, fraudulently used. But um, we, you know, have not set a threshold or any, uh, you know, specific levels there. There's also, there's a, a biotechnology um, group, working group, AC21, that made a lot of recommendations to the secretary regarding contamination of seed and trying to improve the, um, you know, security, safety, integrity of organic production, um, and there's a lot of work being done on from different parts of the USDA other than the NOP that are looking at uh, germplasm review and, and um, all kinds of different efforts to identify where there may be problems and what can be done to prevent further problems. I don't know if someone else wants to add there. Does, yeah, this, uh, Kiki, do you want to provide a quick update from the NOSB perspective? Okay. Um, the NOSB is working on this issue of seed purity from GMOs in particular. Uh, we have issued uh, several discussion documents and then a report most recently at our spring meeting. One of the main, well, two of the main things that we've concluded is that there needs to be more um, economic data collection on how much contamination is occurring from GMOs and how much testing is being done to combat this data. And so uh, we are continuing to try and um, 
formulate a plan for the next steps to make that happen, as well as more research on how significant um, the how contamination can be avoided. And that will, is an ongoing project that may take some time. And I'll just say um, the genetic purity issue and protecting seed use and organic systems from the unwanted presence of genetically engineered material remains a policy priority at Organic Seed Alliance. If you go to our advocacy page on our website, you'll find a page for our policy positions, a few of which articulate in great detail um, our position and perspectives on the seed purity issue, including responses to the National Organic Standards uh, Board's work on this issue. Um, we were also very much involved in the AC21 groups um, process and uh, providing comments to their draft recommendations as well, which we believe are are rather inadequate in uh, addressing the interface of GMOs and organic agriculture. And unfortunately, the burden remains on those um, in the organic community, the organic community and others who are, are trying to avoid um, contamination by genetically engineered material. But, we, but obviously, there's no silver bullet approach. And it does demand a comprehensive approach to address the challenges of um, keeping um, uh, seed protected from, again, contamination by unwanted genetically engineered material. And we want to make sure that any policies implement, implemented don't have the unintended consequences of uh, hindering um, the success that we've made and progress we've made in increasing the availability of organic seed. Okay, um, I guess we have a couple questions that are sort of wondering how um, how it's really verified that um, seeds that are used are organic. I mean, do do certifies do certifiers ever test analytically to confirm um, whether seeds are organic, and is there a way to do that? Um, I'll well, take that one. Okay, if you want. Um, we look for the seed to be certified organic. Uh, that would be the number one role and if they are certified who whatever uh, entity certifies them will have their residue testing program which may not test every seed every year but may eventually in the spot checking come around to testing that seed we don't routinely test but we look for a certified organic seal and after after that we might look for say um, home safe seed from a certified organic operation, which is becoming more and more co common nowadays, or even seed from backyard gardeners um, and seed savers and the like, at, which would be a next preference after certified organic seed, but before straight conventional seed. Okay. Um, can someone address the organic seed requirements for microgreens and sprouts? Uh, well, this is Emily. Uh, sprouts are required to have organic seed. Um, microgreens, uh, it depends on the de definition. I, I, I'd have to really look at that more closely. It depends how long they grow it, but all sprouts, I mean, if it's basically grown in trays with no water, I mean, with no uh, media, that's pretty much the same as sprouting. It would be an organic seed requirement, but we'd, we'd probably have to break that down and look at that a little closer. Um, Zia, do you have a, an opinion on that? No. Mm -hmm. uh, this is this is Colin at, at Mosa. Maybe there needs to be a, a little clarity that for sprouts, there isn't a commercial availability uh, exception to sprout seeds that are used for human or livestock uh, consumption sprouts, that, that there isn't a, an ability to search for organic and then purchase non-organic. Um, but when it comes to microgreens, we have, uh, we have generally thought that microgreens are not considered sprouts because it, there is a, you cut the, typically it, it is in media and it does grow and you typically cut at the, the base of the, um, the, uh, the soil uh, and then using that, that would be what's, what's, um, what's sold. So we wouldn't consider um, microgreens to be analogous to to sprouts, so there'd be different um, requirements for seeds based on whether it was a sprout or whether it was a 
microgreen. And maybe that's a, an issue of debate within the community, but that's kind of where most has come down. Well, that, I think that sounds reasonable. It's just that microgreens has not been super well identified. I think it's right, exactly. Yeah, styles that's growing them. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, do you, let's see. Does someone wants to know if there's a list of um, organic seed analyzers and certifiers available somewhere. Well, on our USDA website, we have on the, on the home page, there's a section on certification, and it, it provides a list of all the certification agencies. So um, any, you know, any one of our USDA accredited certifiers can, can certify organic seed. So that would be a place to start. I don't, analyzers, I'm not really sure what they're looking for there. Okay. Um, does anyone know whether there are any um, software, um, if there's any software available, tools that are available for farmers to use to track organic seed use and yields? Uh, okay. I don't, but that's a great idea. <laughs> There, there are a lot of now farm record keeping software programs that try to orient themselves to organics and um, I can't tell you the list of them off the top of my head but I do know that uh, for instance some farm publications uh, like Growing for Market had an article this winter which listed a whole bunch of them and discussed the pros and cons and I've seen it in other farm publications too and so you would just have to you know look for something like that to find out what they all are but a number of them do um, allow you to track seeds and even prepare seed orders based on what you're in like you can put in your um, I want to plant um, a thousand square feet and it will of broccoli and it will pop out how many seeds you need to order Okay, um, we only have time for another question or two here. Um, this one's about um, the one-year requirement for growing organic seed. Can you explain more? It seems minimal. Are the same requirements as for regular organic growing applied for seed growing? Um, I think we'll stop there because there's a lot of questions in one here. Um, I think what the question means is uh, when, when a organic seed is certified, how you know what? what yeah, are how long? Mm -hmm requirement how long right well mm -hmm. it would be as far as I know certifiers are Im implementing that uh, you know if a plant breeder is breeding seeds that the the last generation has to be uh, like the parent generation has to be raised on a farm that's fully organic so the soil has had three years of no prohibited substances or no prohibited fertilizers and nothing can be applied to that material so you they would plant uh, I guess harvest the seed from the parent plant that had been planted on a organic farm. Um, am I saying that correctly? Does anyone want to um, certifier have any other response there? Yeah, that would be similar to how we we would look at it in Mosa. Okay. Okay, thanks. Um, I guess we just have time for one more question because um, we're running out of time here. Um, but this is back to the issue of. Um, double standards concerning the acceptance of chemically treated seeds in organic operations abroad. So this person is under the impression that the EU and Costa Rica could use chemically treated seeds according to their own phytosanitary laws. Do you have any comments on that? Uh, well, this is Emily. I'm not a specialist on the international aspects, I have to say, but um, I believe um, it would depend on the kind of relationship. If if it's an EU equivalent, if it you know many of the foreign certified operations are certified directly to USDA standards, um, but except the ones that are in the EU now we have an equivalency agreement there. So if that is an issue, if people, I don't know that that's an issue, um, but if that is an issue, that would be a topic to bring up to our attention, and we could investigate it because we continually monitor the uh, terms of the agreements with the EU and Japan and the other and Canada so that could be something we could look into further okay thank you um, we are running out of time um, but I wanted to thank everyone for all your questions and once again and mention once again um, that 
If you have further questions, um, you can either use the eExtension Ask an Expert service and we will find you um, a way to direct your question and get you an answer. Um, and then also the Organic Seed Alliance has provided um, contact information, so hopefully everyone will get their questions answered. Thank you so much, um, Kiki, Emily, Zia, and Cullen for presenting this webinar, and thanks to everyone for joining us.